dos, ¿qué tiene la de pastor? Salsa, cilantro, uh, they, they put onion and cilantro on it yeah, that's and good. sauce. You cool that's with cool. it? Yeah. You want the sauce on, on the side? No, no, I'm sure I like it. All right, let's do it. Me gusta el ánimo este muchacho, eh? Yo no me gusta la danza. Mi panza me tiene confianza Trae a la esposa del chef que quiero besarla Tenedor, cuchillo, cuchara Listo amigo, esto es Ñam Ñam Extravaganza Yeah Bienvenidos a esta emisión de Ñam Ñam Extravaganza Donde todo se trata de tragar y platicar Pues bien invitado, pues ahí está el nombre de su grupo Atrás en la marquesina porque tocan esta noche con presentarlo Músico, compositor, escritor de series, ganador de Grammys Un fuerte aplauso para el señor ¡El Raquini! ¿Cómo oh, estás? No estoy mal, no estoy mal Uh, you want to get some churros? Oh yeah, please. All right, please. Let's go get some churros. There's one nearby. Fanny, mientras nos hablas de estos churros de pasión. Churrería El Moro. Comencemos celebrando que el churro es un invento mexicano. Not. Podríamos celebrar muchas cosas de nuestra gastronomía, pero lamentablemente el churro no se sabe a ciencia cierta si proviene de China o España. Lo que es una realidad es que fue hasta los años 30 que México pudo probar y obvio mejorar este sabor. En 1933, cuando el español Francisco Iriarte descubrió que no se vendía ese grasoso, delicioso y azucarado postre que tu abuelita se toma con un chocolatito caliente decidió emular a un popular vendedor ambulante árabe de churros conocido en España como El Moro al igual que El Moro puso un carrito en la calle donde vendía este producto que rápidamente cobró fama y dos años después la permitiría abrir lo que ahora es un popular local ubicado en el centro de la ciudad de México donde con el paso del tiempo se agregarían deliciosas tortas mmm en serio delicioso Actualmente cuenta con sucursales, pero nada como el sabor de la original, misma que además está llena de historia y ha sido visitado por personalidades como Cantinflas, Octavio Paz, a los Fuentes y ahora Isra Koenig de Empire Weekend. Oh. El Rahul, so have you tried churros before? In my life? But oh not, yeah, yeah, of course. But not Mexican churros, you know? Or have you? I maybe no. never had one in Mexico. Now is the time. Yeah. Señito, le le encargo unos churros para mi compa, el, el Ezra. Hola, Marta, ¿cómo le va? Traje un amigo muy famoso de otro país. Ah, hola, bienvenido. Hey, she's you're handsome. Oh, gracias. Uh, they also have like sandwiches here, like tortas. You want to try one or just the churros? Oh, yeah, I try that. You got oh, yeah, yeah. you're down for it. I like, I like that attitude. I like that attitude. It is. Uh, yesterday at the concert, you said uh, you recorded a song here. I didn't. I didn't know about yeah, that. Yeah. The, the, the cousins. cousins. In my cousins and you and your cousins, I can feel it coming. How did that happen? You were uh, on tour. You happened to have a friend with a studio here. Or? It was. Uh, well, it was like the early days. So we were like really busy. So we were still touring the first album a little bit, but also trying to record a follow-up very quickly. You know, just to like keep the momentum. And I'd started writing Cousins earlier, but we had a bunch of days off, so you know, we did, they took us to go see like the pyramids and tourist stuff. And then we just said like, is there a studio nearby? And they, somebody found us one. It was owned by a, a guy from uh, that band Molotov. Oh. Yes, yeah, so we just went and recorded it. And then, and then because it was kind of fresh, we, the first time we ever performed it was in Guadalajara. So I always kind of associate that song with like the first time we came to Mexico. And it has this like kind of ska sounds that mm -hmm. is it related to the Mexican culture or is it just a uh, nice coincidence? Because when it starts it sounds like La Maldita Vecindad, like hey, hey, ah! Yeah, I mean, I can see that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I thought it, I think it has like Southern California ska punk vibes. See, it's not a million miles away. I've always found uh, Vampire Weekend related to yeah. comedy, like o Oxford Comma. Now your first tracks, like the Vampire Weekend film, like the Cape Cod. All these things, like right. funny songs. <laughs> then you did this collaboration with Steve Buscemi for the American oh, yeah, Express, yeah, right. which is hilarious. Oh yeah, I mean, he's where amazing. he takes you out and the, yeah. the concert is already sold out and yeah. you make me do this thing. Yeah. yeah, I think it sold out yesterday. Why didn't you tell me? We thought you knew. I'm out there busting my ass 
promoting a sold out show. Then you're married to Rashida Jones, who had these uh, two awesome series. Then Jerry Seinfeld participated on your new video, directed by Jonah Hill. Like, that's true. Yeah, that's true. true. Sunflower in the evening, standing in the garden. Do you think that uh, comedy is part of Vampire Weekend just because you like it, or you think like it's part of an art that you have to put on, or is it just a coincidence and I'm being a huge fan in here? No, well, I guess the only thing is I wouldn't say comedy because, like I said, I, I just have so much respect for like like true stand-up comedy. But like humor, sure, like a sense of humor. Because when I when I think about like you know, there's like a spectrum of types of music artists from like the people whose music is like super serious. They wouldn't even write like a major key song. It's so serious. And then on the other hand, you have like Weird Al or something. Yeah. You know, you know, he's a genius. But like comedy music. And then like in the middle you have a lot of other stuff. So I think about like, I really think about artists that I connect with growing up. I always like the ones who are like in the middle. Like people who, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm from New Jersey so I always talk about Bruce Springsteen a lot. And like so on his album The River, it has a song called The River that's like a really intense song about life and the story of kind of like two people in a small town and the, and the, the way things don't go as they plan. And it's like really a sad, dark song. And then on the same album, there's like a song called Ramrod. This is like a rock song. And there's this like kind of uh, funny song about having to drive your mother-in-law to the unemployment office. And I was always kind of like, albums like that and, and musicians like that, that looks like what life looks like to me. And actually then the people who get like, everything's really serious all the time, I was like, that's fake. Because you know how to like, even the, the worst times in life, or even you meet, you meet people who have, deal with the most like horrible things there's still moments of fun and humor. So I like art across the board, music, movies, whatever, that kind of, uh, you know, like reflects that. Well, I'll let you, you try come on. All right, let's get in. You left the stage yesterday, you have tacos all around. Yeah, they always bring have food for us after the show. Actually, I put in a special request for tonight. What's Do you know about this? What, what's the special uh, request? I saw on TV, Pizza Hut Mexico is doing a special Day of the Dead black pizza. That was your special request? The pizza is called Katrina. It's the Katrina pizza. Oh. And it's it's black and it's got a cheesy crust. So I don't know. I said I want to try that. I might go backstage just to see yeah, some Yeah, come pizza backstage. You can try, try the, the Pizza Hut pizza. <laughs> You, you, you guys met the Vampire Weekend band, uh, met at uh, Columbus University, right? Yeah, Columbia. Mm. Columbia, <laughs> Columbus, Columbia University, where you also met uh, day one from Chromio. That's right. Oh, I could be wrong, but she knows what to have. But he was thinking like a PhD. Yeah, in, graduate in student. French. Yeah. What happened afterwards? Like, you graduated from there, were you still studying what you were uh, giving classes and making the first Vampire Weekend album? Yeah, we graduated. The band, you know, felt promising, but we didn't have any like record deals. Just like felt like a good idea. So I got a job as a teacher. So I taught eighth grade in Brooklyn. But you were um, like 20, 22, 23 years. Yeah, I was 22. Yeah, actually, I still, I'm still in touch with some of my students. Like, yeah, but I wasn't cool at the time. Maybe they were 14 or something, and I was 22. So it's like we really weren't that far apart in age. But I was like, you know, of course, I was trying to be like the adult in the room. You were like the cool teacher with a guitar. Then. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like try to integrate the music too much. Once or twice, I had to like bring my guitar and just put it behind my desk. So I don't. I don't like want to talk about it. You know? But that was it. Like, ain't hey, nobody yeah. else talking about this. <laughs> but yeah, so I taught for uh, a year, and while I was teaching, we played shows. And so by the end of my year of teaching, we kind of like more or less had a record deal, and kind of felt like, all right, I can try this full time. During that time, you were giving classes on, on the day and then uh, going uh, to record during the night. It was like a lot of work, I, yeah. can, I can imagine. Yeah, that was uh, that was kind of an intense year, but you know, I was young, full of energy. I just remember a lot of times like being on the bus a lot. Just like leaving school, getting on the bus, taking the bus home, having to like grade papers. My whole life I've always been really bad at waking up early, so that was like, you know, having to like set my alarm like 6.30 every morning for a year. That was like crazy for me. Do you think that some of the things you live while being a teacher are part of the first works of Vampire Weekend or were part of, uh, of the lyrics? It was just a system happening. 
a good question. That, that's hard to say. I mean, go, going to Colombia was kind of, was a very interesting experience for me because I had a little realization where I was like, oh, college is ending, and some people I know are literally going to work at Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. People are going to get these jobs, and I kind of realized like, oh wait, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> that was the first time that I kind of uh, really watched the way how quickly people's paths diverge. And going from like a Columbia and then teaching at a public school, that was like a big contrast. So I'm sure in some way, all of those things made me went into the writing a little bit. All right, let's go to the... Tell us about every album slash okay. I'm a fan, and this is my chance to get them signed. Okay. It's a 34 minute long album. It had this a yeah. punk video song which came yeah. so viral. What went through your mind during the this Zina? era? Yeah, and you can <laughs> tell me in the meantime. Um. Hey, 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 hey. You know, it's like when you make your first album, you you haven't really interacted with the public or the press that much yet. So you're just kind of like doing what you think is cool. I was interested in a lot of different types of music. I like hip hop and, you know, I, I just wanted to do something creative. When I first had the idea to start the band, I just very specifically had a few rules in mind. And then of course, everybody else added to it. But I just had this like feeling about like how I wanted to play guitar. I also knew like certain drum beats couldn't be a part of what we did because at that time there were really big bands from New York like the Strokes and Interpol and what was important to me was not sounding too much like them, doing something that felt original. That, it was probably as simple as that, just doing something that felt original and fresh. Were you expecting that success all around the world, like having at your first album like thousands of people showing up to your shows? I, I think it exceeded my expectations. Like there's a venue in New York called Bowery Ballroom, it's probably like 600 people or something. And I just remember always thinking, I'd like to go see shows there, and I was like, wow, if we could sell out Bowery Ballroom, that'd be like incredible. And then, you know, so we did that pretty quickly, and then, I don't know, it was just kind of like, yeah, let's see what else happens. I think this was kind of hard for you, I don't, and this is my perception, because yeah. you had the pressure of the first, like, very right. famous album and changing the sound, but then again, you came up with something freaking great. Do you have pressure while making this album? And oh yeah, of course. Because this woman sued you? She did, <laughs> she sued us. It worked out okay, I guess. I felt like we had to make it quickly. Luckily, there were already a bunch of ideas. Obviously, it's so different from making your first album. You make your first album, it's just like, you know, you're kind of like, your head in the clouds. Like, like, what should we, what do we think is cool? What do I think is fresh? And then your album comes out and now you have people like saying you suck and that you're gonna fall off or something. You know, that you're gonna vanish. And then you're like, you want to prove those people wrong. And even beyond proving them wrong, you just don't want it to be true. And you know it's, and you know it's possible, right? You have one successful album, that doesn't mean anything. And I do think Contra's the coolest album. I just think it's cool. You know, cool, like... Uh, and then whenever I meet people in Contra's their favorite album, they're always cool. Like, they have like a surfboard on them, like... They got like a leather <laughs> jacket and they're on a surfboard. I don't know why, it's just like, Contra is the cool album, I don't know. Holiday, oh, holiday, and, the best one of the year. and then there's this, which is one of my favorites, personally, which is dark. This is a dark album, it's yeah. sad more dead related uh, songs. Yeah. I just ignored all the tales of past life. Still conversation deserves, but a bad night. Is it true you were like kind of depressed while, while making this, this, this album? This is the, the Pizza Hut Day of the Dead <laughs> Katrina pizza of our album. <laughs> I was very inspired by the Pizza Hut. The, <laughs> the black Pizza Hut pizza. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things about this album. On the one hand, I was kind of like some of that jadedness set in where you made your first album a successful, second album, you didn't disappear. And then, you know, you look around and you're just like, do I even like doing this? You know, it's anybody has that who has any kind of success. And then you start thinking about life and that can bring you to mortality and what's what's the point? Existentialism, I guess. <laughs> I also felt a little bit like after two kind of colorful albums, 
I knew we needed to show a different side of the band. And it's funny now because like I always get a little bit defensive when when cuz that is that was like the the most critically acclaimed of the album, which I don't think is that surprising because it is the it won a Grammy. Oh yeah, it won a Grammy too. <laughs> oh, you forgot but, it. You forgot about it. <laughs> no, I, I know it did. Oh, but, of course. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think I've maybe used this metaphor before. Like, well, I, I know weed's not legal in Mexico yet. I heard maybe soon. But so you know now, now they have. <laughs> now, now in California, like they got weed everywhere. So people, you know, when people buy their little vapes, now everything is like they have different names, and all it is is two things, right? It's THC and CBD. So one's like 90% THC, 10% CBD. And then it's like 80% THC, 20%, it's like Magnolia, you know. But at the end of the day, you're just talking about two things. And, and I think in some ways, it's like similar with albums. Like the first album has serious moments. Like I think The Kids Don't Stand a Chance is actually one of our more serious songs. We've got Egyptian cotton, the kids don't stand a chance. And then the third album, that has like some like fun, goofy moments, parts of like Diane Young or something. But it's all about the balance. It's like, that has more THC. <laughs> the first album <laughs> okay, has more CB. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, I totally get your point. I totally get your point. And, but it's, all, and it's also like the, the yin and the yang. Yeah. Maybe that's a better <laughs> metaphor, actually, now that I think about it. And then you came back with this huge monster that mm -hmm. has, it's, it's like a humongous chain. But I've been cheating through this life. On the first instance, it has 18 tracks. It has yeah. uh, Hans Zimmer Simple on the first track. Mark Ronson on it, Dave Wan on it. Baby, I know pain is as natural as the rain. Yeah. Rose Tam got back to do a few tracks, which is ah. so weird to me. Like, you never thought you, you was, he just left the band and then he came back to do a few tracks with you. I don't wanna live like this, but I don't wanna die. When you have that relationship of working with producers, it's not hard to go into a room and say, like, like the song We Belong Together, it's something we started before and we just go in and work that way. We go together like pots and pans, surf and sand, batters and cans. And it's also not hard for me to go work with Ariel or DJ Dahi or anybody because you just have like practice doing it. You know, it, it's it's different people, but it, it's not a new way of working. A lot of things have changed since then, but I, I need to show you something. I, I call yeah. it the For Real Challenge. So this is the last time I saw you guys. Yeah. As you at the Corona Capital, as you can see, oh, wow. I'm wearing the Death Vampire we, Weekend uh -huh. shirt. This was like six years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And this is how the uh, shirt fits now. It belongs oh, wow. to my mother now. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> a little snug. Yeah. Maybe it shrank. Yeah, no, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. I used to be thinner. And uh, this is the coolest part. This is you when you released the Modern Vipers of the CD album. Right. And this is you this year. Oh yeah, but, we're in the same jacket. But oh, you were in yeah. the same jacket. What what do you eat? What the heck? Come on, Ezra, tell us the secret. You you had a baby this year, like your time doesn't pass us over you. You're not even bold. Like anybody, you always see a picture of yourself and you're just like, oh my God, I look so different. And then a few years go by. Really, Ezra? You feel different, Ezra? Really? I think I'm a little skinnier there, but. Actually, but it's funny, I've been thinking more now that I'm, I'm 35 and I kind of realize like, I need to start exercising. You don't exercise? Come not on, enough, you, not you, enough. You, no, you, sometimes you. I do, but. You look, you look fit, I you kinda, look like you do. <laughs> I still wear the same size clothes, it's true, but I also kind of just realized, like, time to get more serious. I've always wanted to get jacked, too. Okay. Like, <laughs> so diesel. That, so that, that's like the next part of... I think by the time I'm 40, I just want to do one kind of, like, bicep album. <laughs> Uh, as I was saying, your partner is uh, Rashida Jones. Do you have any pressure <laughs> while you're working on an album, thinking that your father-in-law is maybe one of the best producers of all time? Or you just work on it and don't think about it? I guess it'd be like one thing, I can't even think of an example. Like he's, <laughs> he's such a legend, it's like not even close. My, my issue is he's also just such a nice down-to-earth person that always asking me about what I'm doing. I just feel embarrassed because I'm like, I don't want to bother you like, with that. Oh, come on, Queens, it's just it's some drawings. It's like, like some stupid, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but the truth is, he's not 
he's a down to earth guy. He's a nice guy. And then he he came to our show at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh man, you, and, and, and how was that? Did you you feel comfortable about it? And it was cool. You no, know, I, I then I was like, oh, I hope he's not bored or something. But then he hung out afterwards. <laughs> and he met everybody. And he had a great time. And so that that was special. <laughs> Have the whole family there, you know. This Rob, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just just one more comment. Uh, obviously, you you get this a lot. Like, thank you very much. Your music has changed my life. And stuff, uh, which is a true thing. You make people happy with your music. You, you probably avoided some people from committing suicide and they even told you oh, about wow. it. Like, there's a lot of people who go out with it. Yeah. I was about to kill myself and then your music saved me. Uh, how does it feel to have a band that is just just a band, but it's a joy bringer? It's like a, like a thunder of happiness for the people. It, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer. I'll, I'll say this, like, by the time we got to our fourth album, and you meet people who really say, say, I grew up with your music. So I will say that like, obviously the, the, the hope of having a career is not just that you have big hits. Because we never really have big hits, you know? We, we're, Vampire Weekend to me is so clearly a body of work. You have big hits. I mean, yesterday people was crazy for your songs. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, like fake modest or something. I'm just saying like, we don't have a song that, that everybody in the world knows. You know, we, we never had like a number one single or anything. Our music's about albums and about a long story. So when you're telling a long story, you're asking people to engage with you for a long time. So when you find somebody who uh, says, each of your albums came at a different moment in my life and I, I kind of grew up with you, that is, that feels like you actually, mission accomplished. So yeah, it's that, that's how you know that your work, things are working. Well, you made quite a journey because yesterday I cried like five times. Oh. And so, and a lot of people around me did so. Yeah. So thank you very much for your music. Oh, and no, thank and you. I hope you don't make us wait for another six years. And if you do so, it's for the best. So no, but we, no pressure. we had so much fun on this trip that we're, I was like, we just got to come back here more often. Thank you very much. Thank you. Señores y señores, les recomiendo su concierto. En cada concierto cambian el setlist, por eso no he dejado de perseguirlos. No olviden suscribirse. Ezra, thank you very yeah, much for you. this opportunity. You got a sound check. You had, yeah. you had a sound check to do. You want me to, to join you and just say goodbye to you there? Yeah, yeah. Let's, Let's go. go. Eh, cámara, nos vemos al rato. Mm. So this is it, Ezra. This is the venue. That's right. Say goodnight. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're an awesome person. Oh, yeah, you an too. an awesome musician. Great, great hanging with you. Easy. Say hello to, to the Chris's, Brian and Greta and all the band. Thank you very much. Thank you. Suscríbanse a esas cosas. Bye. Me estoy realizado. Okay, ¿qué tiene la de Pastor? Uh, they put onion and cilantro on it yeah, that's and good. sauce. You're cool that's with cool. it? Yeah. You on the sauce on, on the side? No, no, I'm sure I like it. All right, let's do it. Me gusta el ánimo este muchacho, eh? Pues venga.